remember the day I got here, and I remember walking down the side street, and I remember like it being one of the like, greatest feelings of my entire life. Our neighborhood's kind of like tight, physically tight. Because of the kind of industrial climate in Montreal, there's just like all these cool open loft spaces where they're cheap to rent and people go in and, and do stuff, whether it's throwing parties or building a venue or a, a label. The scene at the moment, it's the best it's ever been by far. If you're playing in a band and you dig it and your, your passion is being met, be it just going to the rehearsal space and jamming, like you're a rich man. What do you want money for? And it is free here, no? I've watched like four or five generations come and go. And I've seen, I've seen people come for three years, leave for two, and then come back and stay three more. You can just survive off nothing. People just doing any type of genre that they want. You see that people are grabbing sounds out of everywhere. Like my first day here, I was I was playing on the street. I met some girl. She met some guy. I found a place within like two weeks, and and it just so happened I had the perfect amount of money to move in. Literally for the first three months, I was just playing banjo on the street to pay my rent. was like terrible, venues sucked, most touring bands wouldn't come and play Montreal. That's why like whenever somebody talks about the good old days, it kind of angers me because they, the people forget, you know, how terrible it was back then. There was like a very little economy and people were doing what they could with what they had and it, and it, it was a basis to everything that we have now. There was a grottiness to the 90s that doesn't exist anymore. I just felt at home in a strange place, so I stayed. There was Looney's, which was like a punk bar. And then there was Jailhouse Rock on like Mount Rill. It was like such a mainstay. Everyone like would hang out at like Biff Tack and like the most north you would go would be like the Jailhouse, which was right at, you know, the corner of Mount Royal and St. Laurent. There was like this vacuum where like not a lot was going on. And again, you know, we were interested in a particular scene or music that just didn't seem to exist here. We just started booking shows at Barfly. It was like easy to book, it was free. And we sort of got a reputation from that. And soon enough, it wasn't just us like going after bands. Now bands were contacting us to play shows in Montreal. At that time, the average rent was like 250 bucks, if that. That brings a certain breed of person uh, that is willing to, you know, to live on nothing. To, just so they can make art or, or play music. And when I say that, I don't mean like make a living being a musician. They came here to make music and make sandwiches during the day so they can make music.
the other thing you have to understand about the city is an island. Because of the French language, Montreal became like a, this, it's a bizarre little island to the rest of North America and the world where cities like Toronto or New York, which were initially much more connected in terms of like if you're a band, you put a CD and it goes everywhere. Because of the French language barrier here, the independent music scene was, is, is kind of like, was kind of cut off by all the bridges because the strange thing about the music, French music business here is that they, they sell very well internally in Quebec, like ridiculously well. Like a Quebec artist can sell like three million records in Quebec. It's, it's crazy. Like it's so hard to sell that many in like, you know, a whole country, let alone just like a little province. So and it, what happened was is that that kind of made all the, the say, outside more Anglophone oriented or the rest of the world business market never could figure out how to put their claws in here properly because it was a kind of a protected market. So all the Anglophone artists got kind of stranded in this little island. factor that brought musicians and artists to Montreal, we would all be living in some uh, farming town or something. I don't know. We would find different places. We wouldn't all live next to each other. It's the proximity that brings people here. The American dream is anyone can make it if they work hard enough, right? That was born dead. Still born idea. I believe that a lot of people are born into social situations where they have very limited options compared to people like myself born into like a like a white middle-class family where you can kind of do what you want to do. Uh, a lot of the Anglophones I know do either like maintenance work, like what I do, or maybe uh, physical labor, uh, whether it's construction, which I've worked with plenty of musicians before, or you could probably also get, I've heard people getting work as like cleaning or, you know, washing dishes and that kind of stuff. Nothing too uh, fancy. My last job I worked as a dishwasher. I did go almost half a year without working. And I, was, I put out two albums, so I worked on lots of music, but then, but then I started to like be like, what's a song, what is a, like too much spare time? What is a note? You just start to question things too much. And now I'm at work and I come up with like, pineapple, pineapple, and I'm like, that's the best song ever going. a bad one. Yeah, it'll be a thing. That'll be a thing. I was writing songs on a guitar in, in grade six, but uh, I would make songs when I was you know, as soon, as far back as I could remember, come up with songs and think about music videos and stuff. I had a song that went like, na 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 pajamas, which I guess is kind of like Batman. It's kind of like Batman. When he comes in so fair and thin, flamboyant and feminine, your eyes are soon engaged to his. You stare into his confidence. And when he smiles, that's when he grins and tells you how he always wins. And you're so sure he'll save you all because he holds you and kisses like a girl. He never fails to please you. You love the way he sees you. And kisses like a girl. But he won't treat you well. He won't rekindle your candles. He is not the true love that you dream of. And on the nights he isn't there, he wanders and you wonder where. Where is your girl 
all so thin and fair Then when you two are in a pair With hands inside each other's hair You smile and laugh and no one cares Oh, you wonder if he loves you Just because he holds you And kisses like a girl I don't think a lot of this artistic thing would have happened had it not been for the, the Quiet Revolution. Yeah, the Francophone majority were basically second-class citizens. So it wasn't all nice and easy by any stretch of the imagination. But it did, it led to this sense of Quebec, you know, kind of taking power, the French-speaking majority taking power back. It, it created a scene here that just couldn't exist anywhere else. It was like, again, like I said, I keep using the word bleak, but that's just the way I remember it. I just remember it being gray all the time. You know, like in my memory, it's always overcast back in the 90s. Quebec decided not to separate. And, you know, within a few years, all of a sudden things were was changing, you know, this sort of mile-end plateau artistic community started happening. In 1995, I was watching the results of the referendum. I was nine years old and I was scared shitless. I had to go through the system here, the like Quebec, especially Quebec system, and also the Canadian system, and also the North American system when I was from somewhere that was didn't have anything to do with this place. Being young, showing up in, in a country, like, do, do they want you? <laughs> do they not like you? Uh, I was a very sort of like um, self-conscious kid. Separatism probably has had an impact on the music scene in the sense that there is definitely a pretty concrete francophone scene, a pretty concrete anglophone scene. They sometimes, you know, blend. 
Um, but they definitely are quite separate. I'll give you a good example. Let's say you go to an Anglophone party and you've never met anybody before. It's a lot more uncomfortable going to an Anglophone party than if you go to a Francophone party where nobody's ever met you before. The Francophone party, you'll go in and people will just be curious and ask these questions and you'll be immediately more a part of a conversation where Anglophones are not, and this is not a bad thing, but Anglophones are a bit more skeptical and take a bit more time and see where you're coming from and who you knew before they engage you into a personal conversation. So right away, that, that major cultural difference applies to life, you know, and like, if I play the north of Quebec versus, you know, if I play an Anglophone city in like Ontario or something like that, the fr French town, there'll be grandmothers who sit in front of the guitar amp who want it like, uh, like as loud as it can and want to freak out with you. And if I go to more Anglophone town, it's generally more conservative type of culture where, you know, it's going to be younger and, you know, it, it's just a different culture. It's a different way of life, you know. So I think that Montreal is definitely a mixing ground for those two different places. say it's important to discuss the language dynamic about all these musicians moving to Montreal because in the in the difference between them and other immigrants is that they come here at an older age and they don't have to learn French. A lot of Anglophones feel very vulnerable and embarrassed. You just hide your your lack of skill. It makes you feel a similar way as somebody maybe asking you about your sexuality or something like something you would feel that you did sort of have to make a statement about or feel was political, feel a little bit ashamed about, you know, if it wasn't, I mean, no matter what your answer was, but it's a sort of raw feeling just within Quebec. You could be totally content here, never having to really grasp, you know, French especially living in places like the Plateau and Mile End that do, you know, have a high number of, you know, Anglophones. People who speak English, I met, they are, they all try to speak French most of the time with me, and then it's me switching for English. I, I think it's just a common uh, attitude like we have as a as Montrealer. I think there's this constant... Uh, uh, um, pursue by some parties and medias and tabloids to uh, depict a, a society where there's conflict around language and religion and culture and it really doesn't represent how I feel about where I live. I don't know what interests they're trying to serve but not mine, not ours. I grew up in La Prairie, which is just over the bridge, um, small town, one of the oldest in North America. It started happening um, probably when I was 19 or 20, um, 
And I was I was working in a magazine where I spoke French most of the time, but I was writing in English. So I just, I think, I guess I developed an accent or I don't know what, it, but I don't think I have it. But my family calls me the Anglophone now. I have trouble remembering words in French and and so I'll drop in some English words. So I try not to get drunk around my Severtis parents too often. <laughs> I completely stand behind what they believe in. It's very much about trying to keep the French language in the country and keeping our tax money within the province. And, you know, I I get it. I don't think it's that crazy that people here would expect you to, you know, know your basics in French. And, and be, wouldn't you want to be able to communicate with the people who live here and who, you know, make up the culture of of this province. I find that in Montreal, it's uh, a lot like the shows feel a lot more like people are actually coming to watch the bands and appreciate it instead of playing to like a bar full of drunk dudes trying to pick up chicks, which is really refreshing because I think in a lot of places it's hard to, well, yeah, it is hard to find that. being uh, like when I got here being English was like um, I was kind of like spooked by it it's kind of like oh man I took French in high school but like man it's gonna be so hard to like oh like uh, you know not speak French here and like living down we, when we lived in the plateau it was like maybe a couple more people spoke French but up here in Utrecht like I barely ever hear French and at work none of the people speak French so Sometimes I just kind of forget that it's like even a thing. I was completely content for all these years not understanding the ads on the billboards around me. In fact, I have probably gone to great lengths not to understand those ads because it's a quiet, quiet place. The difference is back then I really didn't speak French and, and now I do. I don't really speak amazing French, but certainly I would not have very many complications with people because of the lack of French that I speak. So, um, you know, I, you grow as a human, you learn the language because you live in Quebec and it's, it just is what it is. So if you're going to be here, you're going to learn French. If you are strictly Anglophone with limited French, there's not, you're not, there's not many places for you to go, I guess, in terms of like, quote unquote, a career, you know. I know a lot of people end up coming here and only stay for a few years because they realize like, you know, I want to do something else or I want more and I know I'm never gonna get it here. I'm basically moving from Montreal tomorrow. 
more so than I ever have before. I'm like slowly extracting myself from this city. Um, not because I don't like it, but because I feel like it's, I don't have a place here anymore. It's not really for me. I'm an Anglophone and the Anglophone community largely hails from my land right now. In my land, Little Italy, the plateau, whatever. Now I live really far east, basically in the heart of separatist country and I'm getting kind of old and I totally don't have my ear to the ground. Uh, until I was about 10, I lived in a really, really small town called Naramata, which is where I spent my teenage years. I wasn't like a bad teenager, but I wasn't like uh, a good person, I don't think. I don't think teenagers, most of them are not good people and they don't have to be, they're just teenagers. You are a waterfall Waiting inside a well You are a wrecking ball Before the building fell And every lightning rod Has got to watch the storm cloud come Down the sky I've heard of pious men, I've heard of dirty fiends, but you don't often hear of us once in between. I've heard of creatures who eat their babies, and I wonder if they stop to think about I often think of like our stereo in our room and like when would we put this on? Or is this a song for the living room on Friday night or Sunday afternoon? don't know how I would make music just for myself. It would be completely random. I, like what's, even when I think of like what the next note should be, I'm thinking of like, what are good notes? So at the smallest scale, I'm doing it to make something practical for the world that I know. People don't like come here and think like, I'm gonna be big shit. I'm gonna be talked about everywhere because it's just Montreal and like, you know, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily pay that much attention to it. But it's just like a really good place to do like weird, quirky, creative things. And sometimes that means like you get like really shitty, bad stuff. And other times it means you get like really cool stuff. Very little of it has some sort of like attitude in like a bad way like it's like i'm gonna be a cover of anything i'm tired of feeling good i'm tired of feeling good i'm tired of having fun i'm tired of having fun too fat to live too dumb to die too ugly to laugh too sad to cry too smelly to fist too dirty to suck too slutty to love, too drunk to fuck. I'll rip out my fingers, one by one, cause you're not my daddy and I'm not your son. I'll claw out my eyes until I'm blind. And no, you can't touch me, I changed my mind. Fuck you. I have no explanation for Montreal. <laughs> 
being here and living here is truly a singular experience. I can't equate it to anything else. Everyone else who spends time here, regardless of which face of the city that it, they are, are shown, there it, it stands out in their memories as something that is very unique. I've always been a really physical performer um, in terms of what I demand of myself and what the instruments I think um, that I play, what I think they demand of, of me. That physical engagement is, that's the doorway in a sense to kind of transcendent um, um, uh, ways of thought and, and, uh, and, and, and feeling. My favorite thing, and I think most people who play music would tell you it, their favorite thing is the creative process. I'm kind of the only person that can get on stage and deliver it exactly the way it was recorded. I'm the only person that can give my own interpretation of it. But it becomes a little bit like sports in that it's like you try to execute it as best you can with as much feeling and in a way that is impressive. It's not that there's no feeling in it, it's just that there's no more creativity in it. Unless you're playing like improv music, even like the noise guys or whatever, like to get on stage every night and not know exactly what you're doing, to not have a set list basically, is I, I think is quite enviable and it might be something that I try to get into one day. I think there's something about noise music like the, the textural side of it, it's like primal in a way. Like it's, it's, it, it feels like this like really old way of expressing ourselves. Like I think before we developed language, we probably just used sounds and like emphasis on those sounds to communicate. When you're a child, that's like all you do. You just use your imagination and you use your body um, for everything it's worth, you know, you, like it's it's an exciting experience and I think a lot of people get so wrapped up in their day-to-day -day lives like working a job and going to school that it's hard for them just to realize like how valuable it is that they can just create. Circuit bending is the uh, augmentation of uh, an already existing electronic thing. One of the greatest bends or augmentations, we call them bends, um, <laughs> that you can do is something called a body contact where uh, you find two points on a circuit board that you touch with your body and um, your body acts as a resistor and often changes the tone of the sound that the, the machine is making. This is my body. Oh, but I did it too much and now it's freaking out. Oh, it's way faster. My relationship to technology has absolutely changed the way I approach making music. Um, in the early 90s, I was a singer-songwriter, um, and I didn't even know the difference between a dynamic or a condenser or a microphone. I'm into gear, <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. If you want to talk guitar pedals, like I love cables and gear and I love all like synthesizers and amplifiers and, and the internet. Holy geez, like that was like definitely something that morphed me into a new place. Yeah, I had the 
hard time at first to like assume that I was making <laughs> music only like with my computer, but not only, but basically with it. I pay attention to the sound, but I'm not like freak about like the quality that the quality has to be super clear and like I don't aim for the best quality of sound. It's still about the result, like what whatever the way you, you take it, <laughs> the most important is what you hear. I really like MIDI technology. I think <laughs> it it gives you a lot of freedom and it's just limitless. Like you it, you can have like any any sound, any instrument you like. You just find it on on the internet. <laughs> Our generations inherited a whole lot of shit. Education costs being more than 100% higher than what our parents' generation paid. Our generation is more educated and less employed. 30 years ago, you could get a good job with security and buy a house and start a family with just a high school diploma. And now you can have a fucking master's degree and still be earning minimum wage, even if you're super ambitious. That's why I don't feel really scared about being a full-time artist because I know people who have legitimate careers and they are kind of in as shitty of a boat as I am. <laughs> inside every creative person wants their stuff to to find some kind of audience and and be liked by some people yet we are very aware that we're doing very marginal music that you know for a lot of people just sounds like an annoying racket how do you try to challenge yourself constantly on what music means to you and really explore you know music as an art practice like as a like serious creative practice rather than as like entertainment Trying to do that while still wanting to find some common ground with the audience is, is a very neurotic place to be. here about 10 years ago. I was going to school. I was going to Concordia University. I'd just come out of uh, high school and I was interested in electronic music 
and there was an electroacoustics program there that I didn't fully understand what I was signing up for. I got there and, like, you know, started uh, attending classes where they would, like, play these endless nine-minute soundscapes of, like... I, I don't know if you're familiar with electroacoustic music, but it's one of the most, like, challenging and obtuse art forms, like, ever developed. And I can appreciate parts of it, but it was, like, to do that full-time in school was too much. I switched out of it. It wasn't connected enough with music. I think that I'm probably like, kind of cons conservative musically at the end of the day in a lot of regards. I wanted to play an instrument. I, I did an assignment once where I got docked marks because it was in 4-4. There's a lot of young people behind the club just like me. I was left to clean out of our company. Where did this happen? I didn't even quite see. I'm Kiva Tanya Stymak, and uh, I'm co-owner with my partner Moro Pazente of the Casa del Popolo in the Salarosa, and I run our in-house print shop, which is called Popolo Press. Moro is my partner. He should be here, but he's on tour right now with his band, Godspeed You Black Emperor. When we started out, the shows that Godspeed was having were an influence and an inspiration to, to make a space for other bands to play. You had to pay to play shows, like in a regular venue, like in a bar. You had to pay to play shows. So people, we rented this place. The rent was cheap. It was very affordable. So we went across the street because we knew there was a Spanish cultural association over there with a bigger room. After, that was like 400 people we fit in there, and we sold that out too. The funny thing is it's not the music we're selling. We're selling the beer and the Coca-Cola and the Red Bull, you know? But I think it's exciting to see it inspire other people, too, because now there's way more venues to play in Montreal than there were back then. And that's what we need. Like, we need places for art to happen. It's all about space in Montreal. I think we, we, we need more space like for, for gathering, like for artists. Lately, I, as I realized how, how it's, it's missing now. We had a, a nice place called La Brique, which is closed only since it's been one month. It's closed and it's just like where, where we can see each other. Like it, it won't be in the official venues. Like it, it can happen, but it just, it's so different. It's so not that fun. <laughs> We're at my, my studio uh, and it's contained within a larger space called the Silver Door. A week or two ago, there was some kind of really organized police raid, and they they came in here and they just 
It was like hell came down. Yeah, it's over. Silver Door, it's an after hours party spot that's been going on the last couple of years. I think it used to be a Pentecostal church. And it's been this thing that's like died down and come back and died down and come back many times. We get like a cheap place to like play and create. And then when the weekend rolls around, we can just like carry it all out the door into the other room and set up and, and put on a show. to find a warehouse that we could rent that the landlord didn't care about and was zoned industrial, but there was never going to be anything industrial going on in these buildings anymore. I was called Friendship Cove. It was just a, there was a need for a loft space for an unconventional music venue that didn't cost any money to rent, and you could do a non-traditional show and not have to worry that much about how much money came in. Um, so we became the go-to place for like noise bands, noise shows, uh, touring things from out of town that were not really suitable for bigger venues or clubs. In loft situations, um, it's a really intimate community and it's your friends and they're willing to forgive certain imperfections of like sound and professionalism in favor of, you know, like intent and creative spirit and heart and all those kinds of things. and. That's a really healthy, good thing. But there's this glass ceiling on that in terms of the people who you reach are only gonna be a part of this direct community. There's outsiders who are cut out in that process as well. There's people who don't know about the space where you're having the show, who won't hear your music. There's people who have to work in the morning and can't stay up until two in the morning. <laughs> and stuff. I think of them as like modern day salons where all people from different creative classes can get together and hang out and get drunk and then think, talk about, you know, working on something together. You know, these are the, this, this is where it happens. It doesn't happen like one on one, you know, in a very sterile environment. It happens, you know, when everybody's just like a little bit fucked up. Living here after a certain amount of time, you know, it's, you get used to these ideas of this is uh, an artistic life constantly being surrounded by people who are good at what they do. I mean, it can't be bad. Right now in Edmonton, there's this movement called uh, Make Something Yag, Make Something Edmonton. Whereas in Montreal, that's like just in the fabric of the city, is just like everyone I know makes something. It's just, you know, I don't know, like decades of, you know, creative people uh, over the years, you know, it all building up to this point, you know? I walk around Montreal, all I do is crew. I like to walk around town like Shin Lu. Do things and I do what my friends do. Rappers do things and if they don't, they pretend to. Like push drugs, live in plush cribs, trash like a dustbin, raps are tough bids. Well, you get your swerve on like when a bus skids. I'm at your girlfriend's house like Just Kids. Heartbreaker like Richard Hell. Don't give a fuck about your songs or the shit you sell. Corporate horrors go where the buck says our promo's low. It is what it is. What you see on TV. See, we're doing anything just to try and be free. On stage for the shows just to sell your CDs. If you're tired of that shit, better come see me. Come see me. Come see me. Come see me. Yeah, come see me. Come see me. Come see me. Come see me. Yeah. I'm being honest. You should be astonished. And what we accomplished got paid without being pompous. Plus, I learned to keep a promise while you keep deceiving common people who believe you're Sonics that believe you're being honest. 
Certain comments on authenticity is a problem you get to answer commonly. This isn't an anomaly or an oddity. It prominently figures in your policy, but my autonomy just a part of me. What you see on TV, see we're doing anything just to try and be free. On stage for the shows just to sell you CDs. Tired of that shit, better come see me. Come see me. Come see me. Come see me. Yeah, come see me. Come see me. Come see me. Come see me. Yeah, come see me. Figured it out today. This will all be mine someday. <laughs> Where I'm from in Newfoundland, it's like, like almost the city controls you. If something's happening, you go because it's something to do. But here, it's like a free for all every night. There's something to do. Yeah, it's a very supportive place, and I think it's hard. It's it's really hard to like, like break out of here. It's a hype city. You can get your like 15 minutes of fame over and over again here, I find. Because I always just made music for myself. It was always for myself. Still is kind of for myself. I hate hype so much. But I understand like that it's a, it's a valuable thing to know how to play. But it's definitely like one should not get their sense of worth from hype. I think it's really unhealthy. It's cycles of interest for people who aren't really that interested in things to get them interested in things that aren't very that interesting. <laughs> but so many people put so much weight on it, on hype, that it seems like really unfortunate that some musicians like aren't really getting noticed. And it's just, it's still okay. Taste is, is a really unfair kind of schizophrenic. Um, you know, blizzard that comes at you and uh, you never know when that wind is going to like render you irrelevant, you know, or culturally obsolete or whatever. I moved here uh, 13 years ago. You know, I would go home to BC and tree plant over the summer, you know, to make about five grand to give another kick at the can, you know, to be able to come back and hustle some more. I mean, at that point, as students, you know, you just rely on student loans by taking debts to like just live another year and worry about it down the road. Doubt is part of the whole game. Questioning yourself and questioning your work and interrogating yourself. And I would question anybody that doesn't have that, right? I was always prepared for like, to be a dinosaur, to be kind of discarded. And, you know, I didn't want my work to have to like, rely on like commercial success to kind of pay the bills. Ironically, what I'm doing right now, but, you know, it took 10 years to kind of get at that point. The tools I use and the way I approach making music, I mean, I can, you know, you can foster like a kind of power of sound that, you know, bands could, couldn't even get at like 30 years ago. Montreal can feel very shitty to people when they first come. I thought it was very cold. I felt very lonely when I was first in Montreal until I met my friends. I just, I just wasn't having a very good time in Calgary. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to leave and I'd heard so many good things about Montreal. And Katie and Austin and Taylor were all accepted into McGill University. So it was just very natural for us to all move together. It worked out really well. Like I remember the first time that I went to Lab Sintez um, I was just walking around in the snow. I didn't really have anything to do and I like heard that there was a show going on with this like weird guy, Sean Nicholas Savage. And I had no idea where Lab Sintez was so I was just walking around and then I heard music coming from a building down over there on Beaubien. And I walked upstairs and I was just wearing my big snowsuit with my sweatpants and my big boots 
and some big gloves. And I was very poorly dressed for Montreal fashion. I, I was very Calgary fashion, very casual. And I went to this show and uh, I felt so out of place, but so good to be there. And I feel like those, those two things like don't coincide or like collide very often. I remember when I was 17, I played an Indian Sosi show and it was kind of in like the more seedy area of Calgary um, at the Royal Alberta Legion. And there was just some woman who like came in off the street who was, I don't know, like she's just like a kind of wrinkly lady, like looked like she has a somewhat like hard to do life. And uh, I was just like singing with my loop pedals and making like really weird sounds and doing a lot of like kind of uh, church harmonies and things like that. And she just came up to me with like so many tears in her eyes af afterwards. And I was just 17. She's like, oh my God, like that touched me so deeply. And like, I love that so much. And she's like, oh, like you angel, you angel. And she was just like kissing me and she had like tears going all down her face. And I was like, whoa, like, ah, I like, I couldn't believe that, that the music that came from me or was channeled through me, like, Touch that, touch that woman that much. Tears, tears is a pretty good signal that you're doing something. I feel very good here. I really feel like I can be myself. Like I feel as though I walk down the street and I'm not thinking about myself. I'm not thinking about people around me even, unless it's in a really positive way. Like, oh, look at these lovely people. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I can just do anything I want on the street and I'm not, um, yeah, there's nothing um, that makes me feel out of place here in Montreal. I always use this analogy that white man, white man in our society is like white paint. And everything that isn't that is a tint. When I was a little girl, I would notice things that really pissed me off. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, just like, why does the boy get to do that? And I don't get to do that, you know? There's lots of girl artists, women artists, but they are categorized as girl artists. They're marketed as girl artists. They're fetishized as something different by guys. They're sexualized immediately. I see, you know, it happens to so many female artists, like immediately they have an image. And I get that thing all the time, like, you're the best girl I've seen on stage. I'm like, thank you. Like, what, out of six girls you've seen on stage in your whole life, probably? I did have aspirations of becoming a famous singer. Um, now it's more important for me to just be badass. 
I don't care if people like it or not. I don't, be, I don't really care if, if I'm successful. I just want to be badass. I never want to do anything I don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a long time to learn that. Someone asked, they were doing some channeling session. They said, what good have humans done? What good is the human race? We've done such terrible things. And the answer was, you have music. I think a lot of people will say this, will agree, that uh, it, it ain't what it was like six, even six years ago. Well, you can just look around, there's more condos being built and stuff like that. I don't know who's going to move into them, but certainly not the traditional mylanders. Yeah, I, you know, it's become more difficult to do things in this neighborhood specifically, but that's always going to happen. Uh, and the artists will all just move around because the artists and musicians continue to have the same amount of money, which is, which is none. You know, such is the cycle of gentrification. This community is obviously moving further north. I think it's, it's less concentrated now. Politically, culturally, it's, it's not the easiest climate to live in. Everyone kind of perpetually feels like an outsider. There isn't like a big commercial industry here, so there, there isn't the kind of attention that you get um, in New York or Toronto or LA. And so you can kind of like be an artist here and not have like the glaring spotlight on you right away, which is a nice thing as like a developing artist to do. You're gonna keep hearing uh, new artists there's, you know, new generations of kids getting out of college and high school all the time coming here. You see trends start in Montreal. It's like things ha start here and then they kind of percolate and diffuse and kind of get watered down and other people interpret them. And so you have an arcade fire and then, you know, in England you have a Mumford and Sons and, you know, there's all these kind of like mediocre versions of the original. And now there's like a thousand Grimes rip-offs, you know, all around the world, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's just, you know, the way, th the way culture works. Consumerism needs to grow to survive. Like, we're just constantly getting more and more stuff, more and more bands, more and more music, and um, that's, a, that's an interesting challenge, I think, both conceptually to overcome um, to overcome the sort of like oh, heaviness that that puts on on us as people and as artists and as makers of things, the heaviness of the knowledge that there's so much stuff, oh, like that's heavy, you know. It feels like hard sometimes, but that's a challenge. That's a challenge. You overcome that, or you don't, or you gripe about it your whole life. <laughs> and the other thing that I think is interesting is like there's still stuff that resonates with people. There's still music that resonates with people. Just do it. That's the main thing, I think, is just do it. 
And I'm still like, I think a lot of people think of me as like a young generation of musicians still. And I'm just trying to do it. So anybody younger than me should just fucking do it even more than I do it. Because I don't even do it that much, but I try to do it as much as I can. But if they're doing it more than I'm doing it, then they're doing it. If you're writing a song and it's like uh, not really catchy enough or like poppy enough to remember it after you write it, then like you should just chuck it in the garbage because uh, no one's going to give a fuck anyway. You know what I mean? You just got to like sit down in your room, just fuck around, record everything you can, and just put it out. Being a guy who grew up listening to Jimi Hendrix and classic rock and, and, and not the classic rock, not, not any of the later 70s stuff that really utilized saxophone, um, just guitar heavy classic rock was my dad's thing. Um, I, I never really saw um, the role for my, at that point, chosen instrument in the music that I really liked. I spent most of my freshman year pretty much locked away in a practice room about 10 hours a day practicing. And then I remember one day, right before a lesson, I was in the studio waiting for my professor to come in and I was playing something over and over again that had just gotten in my head and it was just this, it's just a simple pulse um, multiphonic uh, with a little lilting melody that happens over the top that's all voiced. Um, and I just remember my teacher run into the studio like, Barge and he opened the door really forcefully and jumped in. He was like, "What are you doing?" And immediately I got really um, bashful about it. I was like, "Nothing. I wasn't doing anything wrong." Uh, but he, his meaning was, "What? What are you doing?" Because I don't know what it is you're doing to make that happen. And so I showed it to him, and then he was like, "Okay, see ya." And he left, and we didn't have a lesson that day. But the next week I came in, and um, he was there. And the first thing he did without saying hello to me is he just did it back at me. I was like, see, I can do it now too. <laughs> and, um, and then I knew that what I was doing was important. like-minded, all these things that people are constantly pursuing to feel involved and to feel as though they are one of something greater. But it's all because ultimately we are. Your consciousness is your own and it's that sense of aloneness, I think, is really the only true universal that we've got. To me, that's what mythology is, that's what stories are, that's what music has. Whatever it is that you think is happening, what is happening <laughs> very clearly is that you've lived a life and you've heard sounds and you've seen images and you've experienced your own emotions and the emotions of others and, um, and you've experienced trauma and, and, um, and bliss and, and love and all these things and, and, uh, and art is the you know, making music is the way that you that you explain those things to to everyone else uh, and share that like that that dialogue that innermost uh, story. <laughs> 